This video has been brought to you by DataVinci Analytics Agency. Hey guys, so I'll be walking you through how to automate fetch data from almost any data platform out there on the internet or like, you know, elsewhere and automate this entire process using Cloud Functions and BigQuery. Now you might be wondering why I use Cloud Functions now. There's so many ETL tools out there like Fibergrain, Hevo, Panoply, but why use Cloud Functions and BigQuery? Let me tell you why. It's almost free of cost. There's so many clients out there that can afford these top-notch solutions, but they're still looking to automate them. Um, and there's been a lack of solutions that actually does this. Cloud Functions comes very handy in this, and it's um, an alternative to any of the solutions you might have read about online. And it's very affordable, as I've mentioned before. Now, this implementation process is going to be very easy, or is it? I'm just kidding, it's going to be pretty easy. Uh, what we're going to cover in this video is we'll go ahead and look at what Cloud Functions are, how to configure Cloud Functions, I'll show you a live example. Then we're going to automate the data of fetch using Cloud Functions and push them into BigQuery and I'm going to show you what this end result data looks like on a BigQuery table. There are no challenges uh, linked to this method. Just follow exactly uh, what I'm doing and do along with me and you should have no trouble. But if you do run into any issues, contact us. We are DataVinci Analytics Agency and we do almost anything data. Now, how this video is going to help you is by providing you an alternative to automation, uh, collecting data from almost any data platform data source out there and getting them into BigQuery for reporting purposes. As you might already know, or if you don't, it's fine. The query is uh, almost compatible with every BI tool out there, Look at Studio, Power BI, Tableau, SciSense, you name it, it's compatible. So the query is going to be your best case scenario. But if you'd like to automate and get the data into other solutions, that is also possible. Now, without further ado, I'm going to take you through a, a live example and I'll show you what it looks like. First, you have to configure your service account because service accounts are a key part of automation. It helps you talk to other services of GCP and get your data in and out of each and every one of these platforms and our final destination BigQuery. So first thing you need to do is set up a service account. I'm going to show you how to set one up, but for the time being, let me delete this uh, existing sample. So there is no confusions. First thing we're going to do, let's name it sample again. This is the important part. So your cloud function, I'll get to it in a second. It needs access to several other resources in GCP to get data into them and out of them and finally into BQ. Some of the most important roles that it require are a big query user and this is going to be job user i believe did i spell it wrong big query let's see it is job user okay so this uh, gives the service account the ability to go into the query and execute a sql code or create a table or a view do all other sorts of things next we are going to need Cloud Scheduler and Job Runner. This allows um, Scheduler service of GCP to automate your cloud function so it's run again and again and again on a specific interval of time. Then, third thing we would need is a cloud storage. Well, I think it's just storage, but let's see. Store. Rich. Yeah, so this gives access for Cloud Function to store the final CSV extracted from an API endpoint into a bucket. Bucket's kind of like a Google Drive where you can store uh, PDFs, CSVs, or um, like you know, non binary formats like videos, images, use them for machine learning, or whatever the purpose is you can store them in cloud storage and it's very accessible. So these three are the key roles that you need to specify for your uh, service account. And since I've already done it, um, I'm not going to do it again over here. So let's uh, 
get into Cloud Functions. But before that, I'm going to give you an overview of what um, API I'll be pulling data out of. So this way, you're not left like you know wondering what I'm doing. So AdApp is an app used by one of my clients. They provide courses for their employees. Uh, and they want to understand if their employees are doing better after taking these courses and getting an increase or like leaving their jobs and like, you know, getting better jobs and so on. Okay, now all that data exists inside um, the API endpoints of AdApp. But for the time being, I'm just going to show you what endpoint that exists in, but I will not be looking at that. We're going to go with something much simpler. So course progress is what contains data from all employees of my uh, client and the data they actually need but it because it's so large I'm not going to uh, execute that specific function because we could be here forever and I'm trying to keep the video short. We'll look at users. Uh, it shows my client's uh, users data and how I've extracted them. Since the amount of users, the employees, are relatively smaller than the number of courses they've taken, this uh, in theory should execute much faster. Now. When you create a cloud function to begin with, this is the like you know window that you'd be presented with. User, uh, this is the name of my cloud function. User central one is going to be the data center that I've used to execute my cloud function in. Uh, it's because I've uh, assigned maximum number of instances to that specific, would you say, uh, data center because that's where my client's based out of. Then. Um, if you plan on storing a decent amount of data before you push it to the bucket, I suggest you increase the memory allocated for your cloud function. Because it depends on the size that you allocate here, um, like you know the data that you can store in your cloud function before you can push it to the bucket. And if it's pretty small, then your cloud function potentially could fail, so higher the better. But uh, don't go too high for a function that doesn't require that much space. Then, service account. This is where uh, it comes into play. Service account that we previously created will need to be assigned here. And it will also likely need to be assigned to every other GCP source that data is flowing through. And we'll look at that in a second. Click on next. It takes you to the interface where you can type in your code. Now I've used Python 3.10. Um, it's a most reliable build. You can also use PHP, uh, JavaScript if you're more proficient with JavaScript or uh, PHP. Then, unlike um, pip install, which you do on your VS Code, we'd have to specify the functions or packages that we need to use for uh, our API code over here in requirements.txt. Um, interface is a bit different than your VS Code, but um, I, I promise you it's very simple. Then, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to show you exactly uh, what I've done with the API code, but I will give you a full explanation of the API code so you can follow along. Uh, don't tell anyone this, but uh, if you do not know how to API code, pretty simple. I uh, use one of the large language models and just use the basic understanding of uh, API. You should be able to come up with a half decent code. Now, asynchronous processing is something I use for all my cloud functions because what it does is parallel processing. It extracts data um, simultaneously from multiple pages. Uh, if you do not know what pagination is, start an API endpoint for various uh, data sources or like data platforms. They're stored in multiple pages because of how much data there is. You have to iterate through each page and this process is called pagination while you're API coding. Now this could take hours and hours for it to fetch all the data out. But if you use asynchronization, all this data could be gathered in a matter of seconds and presented to you or pushed to uh, your bucket, which is precisely why I've used asynchronization processing now. And the first part of my code writes um, the API code and handles pagination. Once that data is uh, pulled out of the API, I've Okay, I think I'm not using. Yeah, okay, so it handles both. Usually for my other cloud functions, I've handled asynchronization processing in two different functions, but as you can see here, I've counted them both in the same function by using the AIO, like, you know, HTTP function over here. 
this automatically uh, installs asynchronization while pulling out the data. So each page uh, of data is pulled simultaneously at the same time. So we'd not be waiting a long time. Then the fetch data is converted into a CSV using the data to CSV shrink function. It's going to store the data frame on cloud function and then it's going to convert them to a CSV and it's going to hold it here as a CSV. Then we're going to write a function to upload this converted CSV to our bucket. So for the sake of this um, client, like the uh, project, I've created a bucket called edout since we're pulling data out of edout, like, you know, API. And as you can see, the user data has successfully been appended here, but I will let it run again so you can see that it actually works. You'd need to then specify global variables such as the token to access the API, the API endpoint, the name of the bucket, and the final CSV, the name of the final CSV that the data is going to be stored in. Once that's all done, we'd be specifying a main function to execute all subsequent functions uh, simultaneously. Now, this is important. While you build your cloud function, your entry point function must not contain any parameters like the main function that you're looking at over here. Now, um, what is an entry point function, right? Entry point functions are always required when you build a cloud function. When you execute an entry point function, which is necessary as this field is mandatory here, you'd have to specify an entry point function. That is the first function that's executed and it must contain all the other functions you've defined inside your um, code here to execute one by one to get you the final result. Um, and if you go ahead and try doing that with any anything other than one singular function, uh, your data could end up like, you know, not getting extracted or could end up in a 404 error and it would take uh, a decent amount of time debugging those. Um, from personal experience, I'll just say, um, just use one function without any parameters and you should be good to go. Let's just test this function out. So, you know, this actually works. It usually takes a second to build. Uh, if you haven't been using cloud functions for a while, um, it would ask you to authenticate. If not, it should automatically do that. But well, let's see. Okay, uh, so the function's been successfully built and is ready to test. And as you can see, um, the user data, CSV, has successfully been uploaded to the app bucket. Now, if you head on over to the app bucket and refresh the page, you're going to see that the user data was recently updated on the 27th of February at 3.58, which is pretty much... Uh, close just off by a couple seconds so the data is in um, your cloud bucket now but the thing is your job isn't done um, now this specific cloud function unless you deploy it uh, it it's just like you know in testing once you deploy it's gonna show you this little green tick symbol here meaning that it's successfully been deployed but then again it's not automated for you to automate it, you need to set a cloud scheduler and connect that scheduler to this cloud function and enable it to trigger this function at specific time interval of each day or each week or month or, or whatever time interval you require. If you look here, it says fail because when your cloud function takes over five minutes to run uh, or say sometimes uh, a couple minutes, it says failed, but it initiates the run and the cloud function has successfully been executed and the data still gets appended to the bucket. So just cause your scheduler says fail, it doesn't mean your process is not working. This is something I found out the hard way, so you should, you should still, in theory, be good to go. Then, um, let's just 
create a sample scheduler so you know how to link and automate this user cloud function that we just created. Now we need to go inside Cloud Run to get the URL to schedule this, uh, like you know, cloud scheduler. We're gonna name it user sample run set the region it's the same region that you've set your cloud function in and this we can do 12 a.m of every day and we can choose respective time zones let's just say new zealand uh and zvt and let's just go to continue we're going to set up http because that's the uh, target that we've used for our cloud functions. It, it's triggered based off of a HTTP request. So that's what we'll be doing. And uh, we're going to copy the URL and we're going to paste it in here because it's going to trigger this URL for your cloud function to run every day at 12 a.m. And you're going to go ahead and use ORDC token, which is your service account, which you've already provided access to run cloud functions and scheduler. So this should come in handy. Like I said, the service account is very crucial because it helps you interact between all GCP sources. And you're just going to go ahead and click create. Now your cloud function, sorry, your uh, cloud scheduler has been scheduled and at 12 a.m. of each day, it's going to run your cloud function. Okay, just going to get out here. Cool. And if you want to ensure that, um, like, you know, despite it saying failed, it actually ran, you can go to your cloud function, click on the logs, and you can see that the data has actually been appended. Okay, there you go. Data gets appended here. Then, as for next steps, now that data is in here, how do you get it into BigQuery? Right. You need to set up a data transfer service into BigQuery. So this data goes into a BigQuery table. Let's go create a BigQuery table inside the source data set. So this is usually where I save my source data. And you might be wondering why, actually, let me just quit this. Uh, you might be wondering why I'm not directly using a uh, data transfer service to get the data in from the cloud bucket into BigQuery, right? So the reason why I'm not doing this is because, let me show you. Um, go ahead and click on cloud storage and then you just say sample. Uh, let's just say it's 24 hours. The data set, it automatically finds, but the thing is, if you specify an empty table, it would ask for the schema to be set. And if you set the schema to something, say, um, date as like a string, and when you pull in the date from the bucket, it automatically, um, would you say, deciphers data types for each column. So if it doesn't match, it's going to turn into a huge issue and it's not going to append the data or mirror the data into the empty table that you've created so to avoid those issues and ensure a smooth data transfer process i'm going to set up a table that is automatically created using uh, the data that we have in the bucket to begin with and any new data that's available in this csv after every run of each day only that data is getting appended to this new table that we're creating because this historical data that already exists in the user data CSV is going to be in this table that we're creating now. So we don't need those data to get repeated day after day after day because that would just result in your client incurring more costs. Now, I'm going to go ahead and choose cloud storage and we'll just browse and pick the bucket name which is going to be user data and just select and we'll just name it sample again because after the end of this video I'm going to have to delete all this stuff auto detect and advanced options always remember when you import a csv you need to skip the header row because the header row is for headings if you don't skip them it's going to assign some random headings and put your header row as the first row it's going to result in you redoing the entire process again 
now let's do yeah it's created it now when you go in and view the schema you see our skip in the header row has assigned the first row as headers so when you look at preview this is all neat now if you hadn't done it this id name email and all this the first row this would be row number one and these would be zero one twos and threes and that would be very hard to replace a query so you'd have to redo the whole process like i mentioned before now that you have this data set you're going to go into your data transfer service and instead of sending the data to an empty table you're going to do sample right then you're going to browse you're going to set the data transfer from user data csv every day and append this only appends data that doesn't exist um, in the table sorry um, so where is the query there you go if any data doesn't exist in this table but it is I think, present in the csv it would only pull that data and append it to this table that is what this append function does but if you want to mirror this entire data uh, inside the csv into uh, your bigquery table you're going to use the mirror function oh sorry the write preference and that will just literally rewrite everything every day and this is something you don't want to do because uh, if you write too much every day it's going to result in you incurring more costs and again we skip the header row and you're going to use a service account and you're going to do Power master just save it done so now this is going to run every day at 12 and and it should push the data into your bigquery table there you go i uh, hope you enjoyed this video and happy automating